Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Ozark Community Church. It is so good to be in this building again together and to see so many smiling faces. It is awesome to be together again this morning. I'm going to open by reading Psalms 135 verses 1 to 3. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. So um, this morning, I picked um, a couple of really great, fun songs that have actions because um, yeah, I want you guys to be able to stand up and get involved. If you don't feel like wearing a mask and singing, you can stand into actions. If you don't know the actions, just make some up, you know, that works. Um, yeah, so let's get started. <clears throat> We want to 
guys so much for your singing. Yeah. 
you for the life that you've given us um, through your death and resurrection. And Lord, I just pray that this time together this morning that um, our hearts be ready to hear what you have to say through your word. And Lord, just um, change us, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen. You may be seated. said I can move this. So I'm going to move it. There we go. Well, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here this morning. <clears throat> and I trust that God will speak to us through the words of Scripture this morning. Uh, when you get the call to preach in... Uh, Sometimes, you know, weeks ahead of time, you have some verses that you're supposed to speak on and you feel like, hmm, don't really want to. I have no desire. And then you start praying that God would give you that desire and begin to fill you with that desire so that you are willing to do this, not out of compulsion. So I'm willing. <laughs> I'm willing this morning. 
And I've chosen to speak on Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. And just as an introduction, this is the coming of the Holy Spirit or the day of Pentecost. Now, Pentecost happens 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there were three Jewish festivals that every Jewish male was required to attend at the place that God chose. And these festivals were Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And after the building of the temple in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the place where the people would attend. And in according to the law, according to Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, the man or the adult male was not supposed to come to the temple without a gift. And he was supposed to give according to the blessing that the Lord had blessed him with. And Passover was the celebration of the wheat harvest. It also is the celebration of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Today, Pentecost is celebrated as the coming of the Holy Spirit by the Christian church. Now, because of the requirement to attend these festivals, Jerusalem was filled from people from far off, from many different districts, and they were obliged to come. That is why in Acts chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, you have approximately 15 different districts mentioned from where the Jewish people had come. Now, these people that were at Pentecost would have been there 50 days prior during that week when Jesus was crucified. And they would, may, would very well, some of them would very well have taken part in condemning Jesus to death. Now, at this ascension of Jesus Christ at the Mount of Olives, the, the disciples had been instructed by Christ to go to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were supposed to wait there because the Holy Spirit would empower them. And so the disciples, together with their wives and some other women, including Mary, uh, the brothers of Jesus, they were up in an upper room. There was 120 of them, and they were gathered together in prayer. And so when the day of Pentecost had fully come, suddenly there was a sound as a rushing wind, a mighty wind. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and it appeared to them as clothes of fire or tongues of fire on their heads. And they began to proclaim the mighty deeds of God. And when this was heard by the groups that were in Jerusalem, they came together and Peter began a sermon, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2. We have part of it in Acts chapter 2, 37 to 47. And that's what I want to speak on today. In verse 37 it says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified, and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had been or those who had received his words were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer and everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have at need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, Peter's sermon really, really cut these people's hearts because he accused them of killing Jesus. That's what it says in verse 36. Therefore it says, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So they were guilty of crucifying Christ. And the convicting work of the Holy Spirit was working in their hearts. They had crucified Christ, 
And Peter said he was now exalted in heaven. And they realized that they were doomed to destruction. And they asked, what can we do? What can we do? Their question had a sense of desperation to it. And Peter's answer was, they were to repent. That means to acknowledge their guilt. They had rejected Jesus, and now they were to trust him for salvation and forgiveness of their crime. Repentance means to turn from your sin and turn toward God. It is a change of mind. Without repentance, there is no salvation. There has to be repentance. You have to be sorry, a godly sorrow for your sin. Not just sorrow, sorry that you got caught, but realizing that you are guilty before the Lord for your sin. And then he says you're supposed to be baptized. Now, baptism identifies us with Christ, that we have died to sin and been raised to newness of life in Christ. And then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that promise is valid today. We realize that promise is as valid today as it was then. When you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you are receiving the Holy Spirit at that moment. And you are to be baptized. It is a command. It is a command. You are to be baptized when you have professed faith in Jesus Christ. It is his uh, will that we are do that. And it says that as many as God will call will respond in reality. And the response to that time was huge. 3,000 souls were saved that day. I want to speak on verse 42. There's four things found in verse 42. The first one is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And the they refers to those people who were being saved that day. They were devoted. Now the word devoted carries the meaning of adhering to with strength. It's like super glue. And it's, they're serious about what they're devoted to. And it is the present, in the present tense, it is an ongoing, continuing action. And they adhere to the apostles' teaching. They didn't have a New Testament or a Bible. And the apostles' doctrine was delivered orally. And it was the inspired word of God. The 3,000 three, I mean, 3, new believers said, well, we are standing on the word of God. It may be popular or it may not be popular. But this is our foundation. And it's going to guide and it's going to direct all of our decisions. It's going to determine the decisions we make financially. It's going to guide who we are in our careers. It's going to direct our paths in our marriages and in our families. It's going to affect every day of our lives. We're going to listen to it, and we're going to know it, and we're going to live by it. And every time, or every single time that we encounter it, we're going to ask God, God, what needs to change in my life? God, what do I need to do differently? Because, Lord, I do not want to leave my encounter with you the same as when I came in. Whatever you want me to do, God, is what I want you to do. In Psalm 119, verses 7 and 8, it says, As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. They were devoted to fellowship, to doing life with other believers. You see, they knew that together was better. And even this is better than it was before. I mean, before we could all sit close together. But this is way better than sitting in your living room in your house coat and watching YouTube. This is way better. Because this feels, even feels better. Just feels better. And this is my own opinion, but I believe Satan is trying to destroy our fellowship. I believe that. They knew they would never become who they were called to be on their own. So they were devoted to serving, loving, accepting, teaching, and encouraging, and honoring, and admonishing, and forgiving, and praying for one another. And understand, they were not just devoted to friendship. They were devoted to fellowship. A fellowship. A right relationship built on becoming more like Jesus. 
That is why we encourage you to take part in Sunday morning worship services, in life groups, in fireside, and in youth groups. It's important. Those are things that are important. Fellowship is all about focusing on somebody other than yourself. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 8 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only on your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even death on a cross. This passage tells us that what Jesus did is because he surrendered his advantages. Jesus gave up his rights and took the role as the servant so that you and I could be saved. And now he is a model of how we should treat others. Fellowship is all about considering others' believers' needs above your own. That's why in Acts 2, 44 to 45 says that all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now we know that many of the believers were from other districts, and they didn't go back home because the experience of their salvation was so great, and they wanted to experience more of the apostles' teaching so they stayed there, and so they began to have needs. You see, these Christians weren't commanded to sell their positions, possessions to help out the poor in the church, but they did it anyway because they had devoted themselves to fellowship. Fellowship is when we serve others. Fellowship is when we count, count the needs of others as more important than our own. And that's why there are so many one another passages in the Bible. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And Romans 12, verse 10, tells us, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, give preference to one another in honor. And Romans 14, verse 19 says, so then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Those are just a few of the one another passages, but notice that each one of them talks about what I must do for others, not what others must do for me. And that's the nature of fellowship. It's what I do for others. They were devoted to communion. The word communion in this sense shows up in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. It won't show up in your new versions, but it shows up in the King James, in the New King James. And it says there, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, <clears throat> is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The word communion in the Greek is koinonia, which literally means fellowship, a very close fellowship. It's a kind of fellowship that is shared by good friends and a loving family. So communion is a time of fellowship when we share the cup and the bread with each other. And that is why this lockdown has been so rough on many churches. Communion is best done with your church family. But at the Lord's table, <clears throat> you're also communing with Jesus. Communion is called the breaking of bread. In the New Testament, that's what it's called there. Nowadays, you can go to the store and buy a loaf of bread that's already sliced. And before, it wasn't sliced when Jesus' time. When you took a loaf of bread, you took and broke it. It was quicker and easier just to tear it. Now, breaking your loaf meant that you were liking someone enough that you were willing to share what you had with them. You were sharing something important and valuable with someone else. And you remember what Jesus did at the Last Supper? As they were eating, he took bread, and after a blessing, broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Every time you take a communion, Jesus is sharing something valuable with you. He's offering you his broken body, and this, makes, and this makes this a critical time in worship. It's a time when you are close to Jesus. So don't take this lightly. Don't just go through the motions. Don't bury the Lord's Supper by making it a mere ritual. And another thing is, whose supper is this? 
It is the Lord's Supper. It belongs to him. It is not the church's supper. It belongs to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11:26, it says, As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it is a time of reflection on what Christ did for us and the agony he went through. It is not a time to rush through it as though he said we should do it and let's just get through it. I am sure the early church remembered very vividly what crucifixion was like, and as they gathered, there would have been a sense of awe as they reflected on the Passover and the story behind that and how Christ suffered for them and how Christ is now the Passover lamb. There must have been a reverence as they shared their lives together and ex shared with each other the experience that they had of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and the burdens that they had and how they were now all gone. And as they fellowship, they realized that this was a whole, a whole new way of life. So when Paul got to the issue of communion, he warned them, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that means abusing other Christians, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and then so eat of the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves, truly we would not be judged. But we, when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for not one another, according to 1 Corinthians 27 to 33. Now, the church at Corinth had so abused and misused this Lord's Supper, that the Lord got angry at them. They had mistreated the fellowship. They didn't wait for each other when they had their meal together, and so God mistreated them. They grew weak, they were sick, and even died. In other words, because they did not practice good fellowship, so God despised their communion. Good fellowship <clears throat> is critical for God to accept our presence at the Lord's table. Another thing that they were devoted to was prayer. That's the fourth principal practice of the early church that they were devoted to. They expressed complete confidence, dependence on the Lord for worship, guidance, preservation, and service. In Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, prayer is essential. Prayer changes things. And then that upper room, when this group of people prayed, things happened. Things happened. All throughout the New Testament, especially in the Acts, you read about prayer. And prayer, when they prayed, things happened. Things happened. Things still happen today when we pray. And I want to share some events from the past <clears throat> that have not included me. Not this first one, the second one does. So, Pastor Bill McLeod became the pastor of the, uh, the 175 member Ebenezer Baptist Church in 1962. And after one year, of pastoring the church, he began several attempts at getting his congregation involved in evangelism. Each one of them failed. He then tabled that effort and turned to prayer. <clears throat> in 1966, McLeod started a deacon's prayer meeting at nine o'clock in the evening on Saturday. And there were immediate results. At the following day, during the Sunday morning service, the Holy Spirit so mightily moved upon some of them that they felt compelled to leave the service and retire to the basement and find a place to pray. At one Saturday evening, Deacon's prayer meeting, McLeod stated that it was useless to pray for revival if the deacons had any unconfessed sin in their lives. But God started working immediately, and one deacon confessed sins of being critical of McLeod, and another deacon took another outside the room where reconciliation took place between the two. 
You can find all of this on the internet. That's where I got it. I mean, that's so you know that. Uh, there's many different uh, sites that you can look, but this is the one that I chose. <clears throat> and I have edited some of it out, so, so you know that. McLeod would occasionally impress upon its congregation the importance of prayer by stating, Miss Sunday morning if you have to, miss Sunday evening if you must, but never miss the prayer meeting unless you're dead. So. Now, in addition to these prayer efforts of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the pastors of Saskatoon had been weekly, meeting weekly for two years, asking God to send revival. On Wednesday, October 13, 1971, the twin evangelists, Ralph and Lou Sotera, from Ohio, were invited to conduct services for a week and a half at Ebenezer Baptist Church. At the first meeting, there were 150 people present, with five people responding to the invitation at the end of the service. By Saturday night, October 16th, the church was packed out. Sunday, the 17th, even more people were in attendance. By the end of the week, thousands of people were gathering in churches across Saskatoon. Revival was affecting other churches as well. The congregation of the Ebenezer Baptist Church then relocated, relocated to the Anglican Church, which was able to seat 600, but that facility was outgrown in two nights. They then moved to the largest church in the city, which would hold 1,600, but very soon it was overflowing. So due to seating restraints, they now rented the Centennial Auditorium, which seated 2,400. Even with that large seating capacity, double services were held every night. The things that took place during the, that revival, many baptized members, or says many baptized church members, discovered that they had never been born again. They were just going through the motions. There was no spiritual life. It was common for the front of the church to be flooded during song services as the penitent kneeled in broken submission before God. Now, after the conclusion of the services, there were after meetings where people would stay behind for private counsel or prayer. Many met with God during these smaller meetings. People were confessing their sins before the large crowds, asking for forgiveness. Deacons and many church members confessed their sins with tears of great shame and brokenness as they had been living in adultery, fornication, stealing, and lying. There was a spirit of love, understanding, forgiveness, and reconciliation that spread. Answers to prayer were continually taking place. The conviction of sin was powerful, drawing many to Christ for salvation, and unrepentant Christians to their knees in submission. Marriages were healed, with some couples tearing up their divorce papers in front of the crowd. Lawyers, psychologists, and a Jesuit priest got saved. Meetings lasted until 10 and 11 o'clock at night, and sometimes even after midnight, because nobody wanted to leave the presence of God. The presence of God was so phenomenal that the people didn't want to leave. Witnessing teams of lay people began going out across Canada, the United States, and even overseas. The results of the 1971 Saskatoon revival, the revival, the revival lasted for seven weeks. The last service was November 28th. The chief of police reported to the local papers that many, there were many people coming to the police station reporting the crimes that they themselves had committed. Store owners were shocked by the number of people confessing to shoplifting. Star Phoenix even had an article about that in their paper. Half of those converted during the revival were young people. This group of people changed the atmosphere in local schools and colleges. There was a high enrollment in many Canadian Bible colleges following the revival, evidence that many had answered the call to pastoral, evangelistic, or missionary work. When teams of lay people would travel to distant cities to share about what was taking place in Saskatoon, whether it was in Canada, United States, or other countries, many spin-off revivals occurred. <clears throat> I don't know if you've read Flames of Freedom, written by Irvin Lutzer, but Irvin Lutzer recall, records a lot of that in that book. 
uh, Saskatoon Western Track Mission had 3,000 people distributing tracks. The Christian Missionary and Alliance denomination reported a 100% increase in the number of people who were brought to Jesus Christ in their churches that first year. Henry Blackley was one of the Saskatoon pastors who gathered weekly to pray for a revival for about two years prior to the revival starting. <clears throat> Blackaby said that the entire DNA of, it, of his life was changed during the revival. His ministry today has touched millions around the world through this conference is on Experiencing God. And he wrote a book called Experiencing God, and it's been translated into 43 different languages. One Baptist group reported that for the first time in their history, they went over the top with their financial budget. So something happened. Gordon Bailey, head usher of Ebenezer Baptist Church, confessed before the church one Sunday morning that he had a very bad attitude towards some of the people in church. And he asked for forgiveness. Then he went home and asked his wife and children to forgive him for being a poor example of a husband and a father. That same night, while he was working in his barn, he had heard of about 50 black Angus cattle. He said that suddenly, God filled him with the Holy Spirit from the top of his head to his toes. He says there was no speaking in tongues there was, or any ecstatic experience, but he knew the Spirit of God had filled him. And he and his wife began soul winning and led about 35 people to the Lord in nine months. Bailey then began preaching on the Indian Reserve close to his farm, and 35 Indians professed Christ as their Savior. Bailey also began having invitations from churches and other organizations to come and speak. Even though he was a full-time cattle inspector, he preached 105 times. Many souls were saved through his ministry, and many churches and people experienced real revival. Although he had only an eighth grade education and had never attended Bible college, God used him mightily in spreading revival fires. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever taken part in a revival service or if you've experienced revival in your life. I know I have. But it will probably, you will probably never forget the blessing of seeing the Spirit of God move in answer to prayer. Uh, in the late 1980s, uh, the Birth Caller Church, together with Ozer Mission Chapel, asked Jan's team to come and have a week of meetings at VCA. And um, the Jan's team came prior to that meeting, and they got the people ready for that revival. There was lots of prayer involved. There was a choir put together, and they began to have a week of meetings at BCA. And I think we were there, I'm, well, I know we were there every night. But uh, in the beginning, the VCA, the gym wasn't, wasn't filled, but by the middle of the week, it got so crowded, so full, that they had to use some of the classrooms, and they set up monitors in the other classrooms so that people could attend and at least sit. We sang today, just as I am, part of that. That song today still makes hair stand up on my arms and the back of my neck. And it moves me to tears lots of times. Because that was a song. That was sung at the altar call. There was a real feeling of awe as you saw people responding to altar calls. People not only getting saved, but people who have hid sin in their lives for years and years and years and had no victory over it, suddenly coming to the front and sharing that sin and proclaiming victory and making restitution for things that they had done years ago. That's what God's Holy Spirit does to people when they move are moved by it. The guilt kills your spiritual life. It just robs you of spiritual life. And when you can get rid of that, you're going to have victory. There was one woman, a wife, she asked for prayer in the beginning of the week that her husband would come to these meetings and get saved. 
on the last night of the meetings, he came. The gymnasium was so full that he was ushered into another room and was watching the service on a monitor. And when the altar call was given, he responded. That's prayer. That's power of prayer. That's real prayer. People who were struggling in their marriage committed that day, that day, that they were starting a new chapter in their life. There was a sense of reverence and joy as people from different denominations could get together and just worship together. Husbands who had never prayed with their families began to have a devotional life together. And those are just some of the results of the Holy Spirit working mightily in prayer. Friends, it's not about the messenger. It doesn't matter who preaches the word. Because that jam scene went to the Manitoba after that, and some people were experiencing such an afterglow and such a glow that they went there and they thought they would experience the same thing. The Holy Spirit didn't move there. It's the same message, same people preaching. It's when the Holy Spirit does the work. He doesn't need help convincing people and convicting them. I want to ask you a question today. What is your spiritual life like? Is it lackluster? Are you complacent? Why? Well, where is it at? I'm going to close in prayer. Do you want something to say, something, Rick? Okay. I'll be quick. Lord, we want to thank you for your Holy Spirit. We realize that Pentecost that came, and it is still available today. The Holy Spirit it is the one who makes residence in our life convinces and convicting us of sin and giving us the ability to walk as you want us to walk. So we pray, Lord, that we may be filled with your spirit and be like the early church, devoted to worship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, to fellowship, just being together. So we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing God's word with us this morning. Um, feel free to stand, if you'd like, as we close this morning.
want to say the revival at VCA changed Agnes and my life for good. It made a whole big difference. And I wouldn't be probably standing here today if that hadn't happened. I'm going to you close with a benediction found in 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 to 13. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for each other and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. You are then dismissed.